release date to tectonic plates. Touch, sense, and tattoo take the temperature of tyranny on Freedom Frequency 1871. Coming to you live now. This is America. We have a founding fathers that wrote a constitution that we haven't lived by in 142 years. Were they serious when they said they planned on owning the weather by 2025? And if you're not pissed off, there's something wrong with you right now. Have you guys seen what's going on outside your door lately? Need I remind you? This is America! Are y'all gonna allow it to be Russia? Hello. Sean Connery here. From Russia with love. Hello everyone. This is Dutch Since your host. It is 8.01 p.m. Eastern Time on May 16, 2014. I want to welcome you in to Freedom Frequency 1871. And I've got my co-host here, Tattooed, with me. Tat, how you doing, brother? I'm doing great, man. How about you? Oh, man, I'm, I'm doing okay. Uh, this past week was just, you know, you have those weeks where it's good, you have a week where it's bad, and this previous week just sucked. I mean, it, uh, we won't go into it, but uh, we got some news and some other stuff that happened this week that I think we're going to need to go into a little bit. And, you know, some of it concerns HARP, guys, Uh, in case you haven't heard. Supposedly, the Air Force has announced that they are going to demolish the HARP site, remove the antennas, and uh, demolish the area. Uh, We'll get get into that in just a little bit. And uh, we had a bunch of other news break this week, which the producer will have on the screen here in just a minute. I do want to tell you guys, we are going to be taking callers. We'll probably be doing that at the start of the second hour. Hopefully, maybe get to it a little bit sooner. If you want to call in, you can get in line now. What we've been doing is uh, people, we just take you in the order which you call. And as soon as we start taking calls, we haven't been able to get through the past couple weeks to everybody. So um, we're going to try and get to that this week and get through everybody. Number is 567-314-9200. Nine six. One of the other topics we're going to discuss tonight is um, abuse. We're going to be talking about why people tolerate abuse, everything from Big Brother down to a family level, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. But first, first, uh, let's go into the headlines. Tat, you got anything you want to get into before we go down the headlines? Um, no, I'd already. Uh... Pretty much, you just handled it just a minute ago by heart. Okay. Yeah, and Tat, Tat has, guys, he's taken the time to put together a full post on this over on his website, tattoot1009.com. And if you're a new listener, I'll spell it for you. T-A-T-O-O-T-T-1009.com. And excuse me, let me get a drink of coffee here. I just choked. Oh, brother. I was up for the past 24 hours, so you guys got to forgive me. Um, yeah, T-A-T-O-O-T-T-1009 dot com. And he's got some stuff on Harp there that we're still looking into. We're trying to find, actually, the transcripts for this supposed announcement that Harp is being demolished. And we've gone through this before with Harp about it being shut down. Supposedly it was shut down. Now they're talking about it operating until June then demolishing it. So, you know, last year's reports, hmm, you know, we already proved those were false. So we're going to have to look into this one a little bit more, especially the guy presenting it, uh, that Steve Quet, I mean, Mick West. He was right the uh, first time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that guy's a fake out. He's the, he's the designer of Tony Hawk Pro Skater, the video game. And this guy's a big old harp skeptic. He's got a whole section of his forum dedicated to Dutch since and debunking me, saying that radar is not capable of producing weather modification, that frequency is not capable of producing weather modification. How does he know? Is he a scientist? <laughs> no, man. He's a video game programmer, man. You know, he exactly. has no more credentials That's my than any point. of us. Exactly. Yeah. He's a video, a video player. All he does is play video games. All of his life, he's only played video games. He's the biggest troll out there. Mm-hmm. Well, they claim to have debunked <clears throat> Tesla. I mean, that kind of lets you know where they're coming from. They claim to have debunked Tesla. They said Tesla exactly. was just a good self-promoter. I mean, come on, man. You know, Tesla was a very 
introverted person. Self-promoter, no way. As a matter of fact, that's why he didn't succeed financially, was his lack of self-promotion. But we won't get into that. They also said harp rings were birds and bugs. The giant radar pulses, they said those were birds and bugs. So, you know, anyways. Um, the headlines. Okay. The producer should have on screen a, a big old graphic that says, Fracking Causes Earthquakes. And I'm going to run down this really quick. Uh, we've gone over it for the past couple of weeks. But for the amount of hell that I caught for talking about fracking-induced earthquakes for the last four years, it's important that people understand that this news has broke. Okay, The professionals, the American Geophysical Union, the USGS, held a conference where they fully delved into fracking, frack quakes, as they're now being called, and where they're occurring in Oklahoma, Arkansas, Ohio, Anywhere where there's a frack operation, we've seen an increase in earthquake activity. That includes North and South Carolina, or I'm sorry, South Dakota. Okay, and people say, oh, there's no earthquakes happening in South Dakota, North Dakota. Yes, there are. We've documented them on the site. We've shown it over and over again. Now, they're not as frequent as what occurs at, along that southern edge of the craton where the Oklahoma operation is. But they are happening there in the middle of the craton as well. Now, speaking of the middle of the craton, this has nothing to do with the fracking quakes. But Missouri had a 3.1 earthquake yesterday along the New Madrid seismic zone. And I'm here in St. Louis. Anytime we start to see repeat activity on the New Madrid, that's kind of a caution sign, to me at least, that we need to be watching out for possible larger movement in the near term. And that happened. So where did it happen? It happened actually east of Puerto Rico. And this keeps true with the pressure transfer that's been occurring from the northwest. It's been happening. The pressure has been coming from the Pacific Northwest and transferring along the plate, going down through Oklahoma where we're seeing the earthquake swarms. And then now it's transferring further southeast down to Puerto Rico. And this has happened twice now that I've been watching that we see a huge swarm happen in the Midwest, followed by a 5.0 or greater happening somewhere just east of Puerto Rico, right where all the plates meet along the Atlantic side. Fully flying in the face of all geology, which says that the pressure is coming from the mid-Atlantic pressing west, this pressure is coming from the west pressing east. So that's leading to fracking earthquakes, and the fracking earthquakes they've found can go up to 30 miles away from the operations themselves. So the pressure builds along the edge of the operation, as we've shown. You, it was denied for years, but now here it is. Now, producer, if you want to scroll up one, you're going to see a really long post with a bunch of pictures of volcanoes, and you can just kind of slowly scroll through that. It's titled 5-11-2014 California Volcanic Surface Earthquake at the Lassen Volcanic Complex, Lake Almanor, or Almanor. And this is really interesting, okay? We started to see a series of 3.0 earthquakes occur in central California over the last seven days since our last radio broadcast. So come Saturday, Sunday, Monday of last week, this past week, we started to see these 3.0s pop up in central California. And the mainstream media started to document them. So like a, a LA Times news blurb on a 3.0 happening at Mammoth Mountain or a, uh, again, LA Times news blurb on earthquake occurring at Clear Lake. And I showed screenshots of that. And then we saw a surface earthquake occur at the Lassen Volcanic Complex, but it was in the lake. So down at the bottom of the lake, on the surface, there was some kind of deformation event that occurred, again, at a 3.0 level. And what that means is these volcanic areas that are, are scattered throughout the entire West Coast are starting to receive more pressure on them coming from the Northwest, OK, and this is proved by after all these little 3.0s happened, we saw a 5.4 strike off the coast of Oregon. I don't have a screenshot of that graphic on this post here, but the 5.4 that struck in Oregon was in the fresh lava fields that exist off the coast of Oregon. And the USGS uh, confirmed that they took little submarines down to go and ins uh, inspect the reason they even took subs out there. Their sensors got buried with fresh lava, and they were cut off. So they went down to see what's going on. Fresh new lava field off the coast of Oregon. 
So volcanic earthquakes in the West Coast in Central California, followed by northwest of there, large earthquake pressure. Okay, so these volcanic earthquakes are just a sign of the greater overall pressure that's been going on for now the last several months. Okay, so that's the earthquake stuff. We'll get into a little bit more of earthquake maybe later on in the broadcast if uh, viewers have questions. Now, also, at the same time all that was going on, producer, if you screw up one more, on the 12th, we had this major weather outbreak across the Midwest again. And this was pretty severe. It was large outbreaks of hail and damaging winds, and the National Weather Service decided they were not going to be issuing warnings for Missouri, Arkansas, North Texas. We sat for a full 12 hours waiting for the National Weather Service to issue warnings for storms that had damaging winds and hail, and they did not issue warnings. They said it didn't reach the severe level potential. Well, okay, whatever. Um, we, meanwhile, we, we documented multiple possible tornadoes. There was uh, severe wind, wind damage. You can imagine if you're out on the road with your uh, iPhone or your mobile phone and you're waiting for that update to come in, letting you know, hey, there's a storm coming. You might want to watch out. No, no update. And it was so obvious. They should have had watches issued at least because the day before, we're looking at 30-degree temperatures going south into New Mexico with snow falling as far east as Oakley, Kansas. And if you guys have driven across Kansas, you've got Salina, then you've got pretty much Oakley, Colby, and then you get to Colorado. So it reached central Kansas snow. Got screenshots of it in case people don't want to believe that it's snowing in mid-May in Kansas. And then out in front of the storm here in St. Louis, 85 to 90 degrees. So 20 and 30 behind the storm, 80 and 90 in front, and there's no watch warnings issued throughout the states that that's happening in. Something, something's wrong at the National Weather Service, and people's lives are hanging on the line. And now they're having to come person after person. You're right, Dutch. I didn't get any warning. This storm's right on top of us. We've got nickel size hail falling right now. Well, <laughs> I mean, do they have to come online to YouTube to get their appropriate weather warnings? This is a question everybody's got to ask, and uh, it really kind of bothers me because it's putting a lot of weight on my shoulders responsibility-wise, knowing that, you know, two, three states don't have warnings, and here I am, pretty much the only guy on YouTube putting out these warnings to everybody, you know, trying to get the word out on a potential tornado that's coming towards an area. And then a tornado does touch down, and I've got people giving me hell over below. There's no warning from the National Weather Service. You're trying to scare people. They came back, the people who said that, came back and said, well, and, and EF0 did touch down, but it only caused damage out in the fields. And <laughs> Are you kidding me? Right? So uh, if you scroll up one more, it back to the frack quakes. This is a 5-14-2014 post. And while all the volcanic earthquakes were happening on the West Coast, and while the Oklahoma swarm happens... We see another earthquake strike, this time in Texas. All right, now we're talking Texas again, guys. So this goes back almost two years to the activity that we saw before the big earthquakes hit. And you guys may not remember, there was a 5.0 that struck southern Colorado at the Colorado-New Mexico border at the fracking operation in 2011. There was a 5.0 that struck, 5.6 that struck central Oklahoma and a 5.2 or 5.3 that struck in Arkansas. Then... Followed all that was all followed by a 5.9, which struck in Virginia and it caused damage to the Washington Monument, which just opened this past week, by the way. That's another little news story that broke this past week. So, this pressure that's occurring in Texas is what happened before we saw the movement, the 5.0 movement. And it's a buildup. It's, you can exactly imagine what pressure building up is like on a, a surface of an object that can break. Eventually, the weak spot is going to push, okay? And that's what the edge of the craton is doing now. Finally, and this is finally running down the last headline that I've got, and this will take you right up to the top of the page, producer. This one's titled 516-2014. Washington, D.C. tornado warning issued for a radar pulsed area from three days prior. And I've got a screenshot of it. It's a radar pulse, what slang term harp ring, um, and we'll get into harp in a second, but the slang term harp ring describes a pulse that comes from a ground base station. And in this case, it's an XRAD radar. And it's at Dover Air Force Base. The 
Pulse itself was targeted west by southwest over Washington, D.C. and just south of Washington, D.C. And three days later, a tornado warning last night at 2.30 Central Time, 3.30 Eastern Time, a tornado warning was issued just west by southwest, and it was eventually moved to the northwest of Washington, D.C., the same area that was pulsed three days before. Such a small little area, too. If you, if you can see the picture, let me describe it to you. you got, it's about the size of half the size of downtown Washington, D.C. So half the size of the square is this little itty-bitty tornado warning that was kicked up last night. And it's the only warning, only watch. Got it marked, got all the severe turned on, and you can only see this little spot. Now, that's happened before. It's happened before from the same station at Dover, Delaware. There was a pulse. It's on my Facebook page. I don't have time to show it to you now. But if you go to my Facebook page, there's a top graphic where my picture is. And behind it, it's a a huge radar pulse. And that's Dover. And 12 hours after the pulse, Dover Air Force Base that admitted the pulse was the only spot that had a tornado warning. Tornado warning hit the base 12 hours after the base pulsed. This is over and over and over again. Got hundreds of examples on my site of just what I've documented, not counting what everybody else has documented. And this now ties in nicely to Tattoot's post on his site, the Harp post. Harp has been reported to close down. Now, this was several, well, now a year ago. It, it originally reported that they abandoned Harp because the diesel generators were too dirty. This was reported by the ARRL, the Amateur Radio League, with an unnamed article, an unsigned article. Some random person wrote an article on the ARRL. That got circulated by a newspaper called the Anchorage Daily News or something, Anchorage something. It's the same people that are running the current Harp story. Anchorage picked that up from the ARRL almost a year ago or over a year ago. And they said it was shuttered and closed down a year ago. Now here they are again, reporting that HARP is being bulldozed and that they're going to take it all down. And they cite a congressional subcommittee hearing where this was just released. Tat and I looked it up. We verified that this is true, that the subcommittee hearing did just recently happen this past week. And indeed, they're talking about closing it down. Air Force has completed the experiments that they needed to do. And they said they DARPA talks about how successful the operation has been and it's been very useful, but in this current budget climate, we can't afford to maintain this operation anymore. We're going to take down the antennas and bulldoze the site. And something interesting is raised, and I want to propose this to everyone right now. Listen up, people, seriously. I'm serious about what I'm talking about here right now. They said at this meeting that they need Five million dollars a year to run the Harp facility, and they're looking to farm it out to educational institutions or others who are willing to put up five million for the facility to use it a year. Hmm, five million, huh? To get Harp, five million a year to rent Harp. I don't know. Do you think the community could do it? Could we manage to ante up $5 million to get HARP, guys? It's for sale. They're talking about farming it out to the Alaska, uh, Alaska EDU, trying to give it to colleges, seeing if there's somebody that's willing to pay. I'm willing to pay if you guys are willing to put it up. I'll move up there. Maybe we should contact one of our wealthy investors. My Illuminati overlords who call me and warn me about the earthquakes every week and tell me where they're going to happen. Maybe I could just call them and say, hey, will you send me the cash? I could just change the $1 million fundraiser to a $5 million fundraiser. How about that? And it's for the purpose of renting Harp for a year. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think about the story, Tat? Do you think it's real even? I mean, I mean, they're talking about shutting it down. But when you really listen, it's all veiled. They're like, well, we'd like to keep it up and... Maybe give it out to another institution. Well, my personal opinion, I think all they're doing is propaganda. Last year it was propaganda that was already shut down. Now we're getting the story which we proved that they had a budget for that. Now they're talking about the budget again and saying now they can't 
afford it, but they've already been approved for 2015. I, I, I'm a little lost on the information. They got the budget already for 2015, and they make this story, and they're going to tear it down this summer, but they're going to run month. it till June. I, I mean, Next it's so contradictory. Yeah. Um, I think they just, you know, my personal opinion, I think they're covering their ass because of what's going on with Russia right now. Yep. And you guys don't know but this, but I can't prove it. Tat and I were talking about this before the break or before we even came on um, that possibly the reason they're packing up the antennas and getting getting the whole facility bulldozed is because of what's happening over in Russia. And that if something did go down with Russia, what's the first place to go? Alaska. And you can bet that if Harp was there, that Russia would be probably trying to capture the facility. They wouldn't be trying to destroy it, or it might be a prime target. Anyways, get the antennas out of there. Get everything out of there. But notice how the guy, if you go watch this thing, um, the guy from the Air Force is talking about how they need to take care and packaging up all the equipment and getting it out of there before the winter so they can get it so it doesn't get destroyed. Well, hold on a second. Getting all the sensitive equipment out of there, where's it going? Storage? Do, will we get to see it go into storage? No. I'm willing to predict that they're going to take down that antenna apparatus, take everything out, move it somewhere, and in a couple of years, when high-resolution satellite imagery is available everywhere, uh, someone will find it orig- uh, built somewhere else. The same antenna apparatus built somewhere else. And it'll take just as long to find it. You remember, just a few years ago, and I'm talking when we got on, when I got online at the end of 2010, Harp was still blacked out on Google Earth, guys. You remember the blacked, half blacked out image of Harp? Then they just recently updated it in the past two years with uh, still a half blacked out picture with half the antenna apparatus. Okay, so finding these facilities, several researchers, and I'm talking dozens, if not hundreds, of people spent hours, days, weeks pouring over Google Earth to find the different antenna facilities. They were all marked originally. A few people, such as myself, showed up and started to put the coordinates out of these different antenna locations. Someone else then picked it up, put it into a 3D map, and made it really easy to find. And he should be commended for that, regardless of what other douchebaggery he's guilty of. Okay? And now, here we go with the shutdown and the moving or storage of the antenna apparatus at HARP. But I would propose that before they do that, they're offering to farm it out for $5 million, guys. It's go time. Somebody needs to contact Richard Branson or one of the other alternative rich guys who's willing maybe to use the facility. Guys, HARP could be used to wirelessly transmit power. Last week's show, go back and listen to it. The Japanese came out and announced microwave wireless power transfer also can be done via high frequency. It's not just microwave. So you can do it with HF. So we're talking HARP. HARP could be used to transmit or receive wireless power. Provide it to the world, or at least to a very large area. That's one potential use that could be done. And stop listening to Mickey Mouse West. Uh, well, I'm Mick, sorry, Mick, I had to say the, that. No, no, no. Their whole forum <laughs> denied the wireless power transfer. When we found that 1975 NASA JPL experiment, Tat, and put it out, where they used 2.45 gigahertz microwave radar, no less, a radar dish to transmit a microwave signal across a valley, which was converted into power at the other end. Wireless power transfer. And it's all about the antennas. So you send a signal from one, and it receives it at the other, the other does a conversion process that converts the microwave energy into DC current. It's proved the Japanese are developing a space-based version. NASA did the experiments in 1975 out in uh, using the Goldstone radar dish out in the field and transmitted it over a mile and a half. So HARP could be used solely for wireless power transfer. Somebody should contact a quote-unquote Richard Branson type person who's trying to do space travel. You could provide wireless power to a spacecraft if they passed over, let's say, the North Pole or Alaska at some point. 
you could beam that power up or beam it down. And it's proved the Japanese are building it. They plan on having it deployed by 2020. Six years. Okay? So six years from now, the Japanese are going to have something floating in space, beaming power down to power city. Their words, not mine. JAXA, J-A-X-A, Japanese Space Agency, guys. Go look it up. And Mick West denied it, said it couldn't be done, said we were exaggerating, trying to get views. Yeah, I'm trying to get views on a 1975 NASA Goldstone JPL experiment, dude. <laughs> I mean, who pays it? I mean, yeah, that's going to go right up there with the makeup videos on YouTube. You know, people are going to love this. And what's oh, funny is him and that other guy in the video that's on that web page, he talks about <clears throat> it gets hot. Go uh, put your balls and on heat it. rises. Mm-hmm. But what he don't understand and what they showed in the experiment was there two, actually three lights. I'm pretty sure there's either two or three. I know there's two. There's two lights that has got heat to them, and he creates the fog, and then he reaches down and fills the box, and it's got a little heat. Well, we all seen my experiment with my antenna where the plasma comes off. Do you think that was cold, people? No, it wasn't cold. And do you think radio frequency is cold? No, it's not. You put food in front of a microwave, what does it do? It cooks it. Same thing. It's yeah. just at a lower temperature you just don't feel it you can stand in front of a microwave with your hand for a short period of time but you're going to feel the heat that's what this is people that's what this is your cell phone does it get hot when you got it on your ear too long yes it does does it give you a headache yes it does why because it's transmitting a frequency that is harmful to your body and to your brain and to your Mental capacity, period. End of story. Mick West can go suck the big donkey dong. Yes, I agree. I second that motion. And I would recommend everybody go onto YouTube at some point and type in microwave with door off. And you're going to find some awesome videos where people have gone outside, set up cameras at an appropriate distance away, first of all, and taken the doors off the microwaves, kitchen microwave where you'd heat up your food. And done experiments. And it's amazing. Um, let, me, let me describe this to you. Um, have you ever seen like a vibrating pillow on a couch or something? Or maybe it's like the sharper image, the vibrating chair that like supposedly massages your back. Have you ever laid your head back in there and looked forward and seen? It, well, it's like it, you see wavy. The best way I can describe it is if you put a vibrating pillow up to your head or you lay on a vibrating chair and look forward, stare at something, you'll see that everything begins to look wavy. And it's a, it's a visual effect that happens in your eyeball due to the vibration passing through your body, okay? But if you go watch these videos of a microwave without the door on, the camera picks up the same vibration that you would see when you have your head against a vibrating pillow, visually. And, and it doesn't intri- have I, I any pulse in it. It's just a tone, a steady tone. That's right. It and had, and a, had some, some pulse in it, it'd be badass. <laughs> Well, and what, what you'll see, too, is as the microwave door is off, objects that are nearby the microwave cook, catch on fire, start to distort, start to melt. He plugs in some gaseous tubes. In the one video that I was watching, this guy plugs in these gaseous tubes to the microwave transmitter, and they spark for a while. They're Tesla tubes, and they begin to melt. We got two minutes, buddy. Well, one minute. Oh, dude. Okay, we got a minute. Perfect. Um The reason we're talking about this, guys, is the potential for radio frequency is to take us into the next century. To be in denial about it is to be in the dark ages. It's to deny um, gunpowder when in the age of arrows. Okay, we know who won that battle. Radio frequency weapons, energy weapons are where we're going. Harp is just a stepping stone. We've all said this before. And if it does get shut down, you can bet your bottom dollar they're not scrapping that equipment. No way. You know, the, the, even if they do, they got some. If they have, if they scrap the whole thing, that means they have something that's way more advanced than what they're using. Like the pictures that's on the web page, it shows you uh, 12, uh, 12 antennas, and these antennas are not dipole antennas. These actually have DB gain to them and are pointable in one direction. 
and they got them all pointed in one direction. And they got 40 DB gain. 40. We'll be right back, guys. My name is Moses. I hope you don't try to quote my identity. You don't know me. I own me. I will. I am. And I better be. It ain't me. It ain't me. It ain't me. It ain't me. No apologies if I ain't what you want. Welcome back to Freedom Frequency 1871. This is your host, Sean Connery. The old Sean Connery, not the young one. What you're experiencing now is called the quickening, McLeod. <laughs> oh, welcome back, guys. It is 8.36 p.m. Eastern Time. Friday, May 16, 2014. We were just discussing Harp. And let me break it down for you guys. Tat's talking about, he, he's talking some technical here. DB gain. It sounds like Chinese to a lot of people. Let me put it in perspective. Everybody understands decibels like loudness. Think of car speakers. You've got bass speakers and tweeters, okay? So you've got high frequency that's going to put out a loud, tinny, high tone, and you've got a big, wide speaker that's going to put out a low tone. Now, imagine what happens when you combine tones. And if you're able to have, let's say, a very nice set of speakers, directional speakers, let's say, like bazooka tubes, in the old cars, those old subwoofers, um, that if you're able to target two sound frequencies onto something, that you can amplify the sound overall with the number of speakers that you add to your system, right? I mean, it's just basic. And then to power your sound system, you've got to have a kick-ass amplifier to pump it, to give it the power to come out of the speakers. And going into the amplifier, you have to have a signal that goes into it. It's a tone. It could be boop, or it could be a big old bass sound, or it could be a song, or whatever you put through it. Now, interestingly enough, did you guys know they put a sound, a whole, um, I think it was Bogner, classical music, they played through harp up into the ionosphere to see what it would do. Did you know that was one of the experiments they did? They put music, like a, just like talking into a CB on a radio, or they hooked up an MP3 player. Well, not an MP3. It would be a wave file because the MP3 filters out lows and highs. So they would put in a wave file or similar and uh, played the music through the ionosphere. Now, everybody understands the sound amplification aspect. We all understand stereos. The same thing can be done for radio frequency. You can cross radio frequency signals, let's say, and get an amplification of that power somewhere else so if you're again the military uses those sound cannons now on the on the crowds you know it's um l rad okay and they can do sound and they can do heat the heat well, i got is- something i want to, I want to add to your little story here <clears throat> back in the day a lot of people that are closer to my age back when the big cb craze was a big thing they had this thing called a shootout and it was Boys in big trucks or vans, mostly vans, because they could use a lot of power and they could build big boxes in their van. Well, they would build these great big amplifiers inside their box or in their vans, and they'd put up an antenna. And they would sit side by side, and then another person would go four or five miles down the road, and it's called a shootout. And they'd both key up at the same time. And they would see who had the biggest signal. And sometimes it wasn't necessarily how much power, it's how clean and clear the audio was. Because what would happen is the audio of the, or the power from the bigger station would be there, but his audio was so bad, the little guy with the little frequency with the clean, clear audio would jump on his signal and ride all the way down to the other person and everybody would hear him and not the other guy. That piggybacking is piggybacking, but it's also crossing the signals. So it can and it has happened and it does happen with harp and all Nectrad and all cell towers. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe me, got a problem 
Sorry. Well, here, here, we can give an example. Um, two years ago, there was a directional beam that appeared over Iowa out of Illinois. It was coming, it looked like it was coming from the next rad in central Illinois. And we all looked at it and wondered, what is this thing? And the National Weather Service came out and confirmed that it was a 4G cell phone tower signal that was piggybacking onto the radar signal and being carried further out into Iowa from central Illinois. Now, this happens, guys, naturally. Have you ever been driving around? This has happened to me from time to time. You'll be driving around, especially on AM stations, where you'll pick up a station from another state away. Where you're like, whoa, you know, like here in Missouri, it'll be like, 1041, uh, Iowa. And you're like, what? Like, I'm down here in St. Louis. That's way beyond their FM transmission signal radius. What's that's happening called, is... That's that, called skip. Right. It's skipping off the ionosphere and atmosphere due to atmospheric conditions. Now, this process can be done manually. People can do this. You can... Um, they have found, and the military has done the testing, so you don't have to take my word for it. We can go back all the way to the 1980s. Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Bearden giving his lectures, Soviet weather engineering over North America. This is back in the 80s, where he's talking about scalar, and it's a term that he coined, but it's based upon geometry, um, of combining two signals from two transmitters, two radars, let's say, where the signals cross, there is the potential for heating or radio frequency cooling, cooling an area via plasma. So the heating can go either way, depending on which way you pump the signal. And he talks about frequency pumping. He talks about taking two signals, crossing them, pumping them, and then you use a third signal to control the plasma once it's formed. U.S. Navy did the experiment at start of 2013 using HARP up in Alaska, which is now going to be closed, right? U.S. Navy, in the start of 2013, used HARP to generate the plasma and radar, one radar to control it, to, to keep it sustained in the same spot, and another radar to observe it, a VHF radar, to look at the plasma and see what it looked like on radar. They did that experiment. Okay, So the same thing can be done on a smaller level using our, our common NEXRAD WSR-88. That was developed by the U.S. Army, by the way. Deployed at the end of Ronald Reagan's missile defense era in the 1988. That's why it's called WSR-88. And the next rad radar now is dual polarity. <laughs> and you'll see when a harp ring pulse occurs, when a radar pulse occurs from a next rad, you'll see now that the dual pole is available online, you'll see that it pulses into a negative polarity. And the velocity... Now, if this we're getting real technical here, guys, but let me describe it as this: the velocity, um, like a like a wind tunnel. Okay, so think of velocity like wind, and the radar spinning at the center like a fan sucking the wind down a tunnel. Okay, and now they would tell you that the radar isn't doing that, but the experiments have already been done in the laboratory by Dr. Slobodan Tepic, who everybody uh, didn't want to believe. But he did the experiments over in Switzerland and used a microwave to generate rotation. And this was done in a, in a tank of water, okay, um, but simulated in the atmosphere, okay? So that's why he did it in a tank of water to simulate what it would be like for a large microwave to rotate. And does it cause rotation? Yes, it does. Now, it's also proved via other experiments that if you apply a low hertz frequency to water, you can make the water move into perfect waves, and I mean, this is a really cool experiment. You can go look it up, Standing Wave, on YouTube. And you'll find this series of experiments done at colleges across the country where they apply a low hertz frequency to the water, and the water begins to move. And it starts going up and down like a roller coaster. And then it goes perfectly as they tune it, just like um, we go back to the bass speaker in your car. You can imagine, you've, you ever um, sat at a stoplight and somebody pulls up next to you, and they've got the big bass kicking, okay? And it's like, and their their trunk is rattling, right? Like they haven't spent the money on the appropriate um, rubber softeners to take the blow of the trunk. And if you go watch these videos online of people with really powerful systems, when they turn it on, it'll blow out sometimes their back window. Like the opera lady who sings too loud and fractures 
a crystal glass. Sound frequency and radio frequency and laser light frequency are all frequencies. They are all all electrical energy. Yes. Electrical energy is a frequency. DC current is a frequency. How do we know this? Well, (laughs) MH370, the missing airliner, had a bunch of missing employees on the air uh, that were on the airplane or a bunch of employees that were on the airplane that are now missing. And the company they came from specializes in, and this is on their website, specialize in frequencies from DC up to 40 gigahertz. And that was, um, I don't remember the name of the company. I can't believe I can't remember that. Well, it, it's irrelevant because the whole story was fake anyways out of MH370. And Obama was joking about it last week, so we can joke about it now and say it was total bullshit. And there was probably nobody on the plane, and the whole thing had to do with the missing cargo, which were the little microchips that were uh, the uh, Internet of Things microchips, new develop by the company. So um, this whole thing ties together. I mean, the engineers, not necessarily the, the chip itself, but the engineers that developed them. <laughs> yeah, well, the engineers and the chip were all on board the plane. Mm-hmm. You know, they were there in Malaysia to fly to to Beijing to demo the chip. And but the, and, and that that chip again, that company specializes in radio fre- microwave radio frequency transmission to those chips for the Internet of Things. See, in order to com- in order for your refrigerator to communicate to you and to the internet, it has to first go to your router, right? I mean, it has to pick up a signal. And what signal does it have to pick up? What signal is your router on, guys? If you've been listening to me for the last two years, you know the signal of the router is the same uh, signal that the next rad is on, the radar. 2.45 gigahertz. And your microwave. And your microwave in your kitchen that cooks your food, 2.45 gigahertz. The microwave out at the next rad tower, 2.45 gigahertz. The the Bluetooth headset that you're wearing, 2.45 gigahertz. It's all a matter and of just. Why do you? I, I'm sorry. I got to say something. People, please stop wearing them things on your ear constantly all day long. You're going to end up with the biggest brain tumor or something. You're going to just wake up one day and you're not going to wake up right. Please stop using them things. Throw them away and buy you the wire thing to go in your ear. I, I, I'm begging you to quit doing that. I want you to be happy and free. Please stop using those things. You're killing yourself. And potentially sorry, others. I had to say that. No, no, you're right. And potentially others because the 2.45 gigahertz signal that's going out, um, there's some question as to whether or not your body receives it, whether or not you're wearing the device. You know, they would say, okay, like the Bluetooth headset that you got on now is at a microwatt, right? Okay, so it's real, I mean, really weak. It's a, it, compared to your kitchen, your kitchen's 1,000 watts, so it's a micron of that. And, but you wear that Bluetooth headset every day over a long period of time, exposure-wise, it's the same as sticking your head in your microwave for a second, one second. You know, you put your head in your microwave, okay, it's going to hurt, it's probably not going to kill you, but it's definitely going to cause some problems for you. Okay, and, and if you live next to a cell tower and you know it's a cell tower, I mean like within 100 feet of it, move. Yeah. They're putting them move on buildings away now. away because you don't know what it's doing to you. Some of them cell towers are putting out 50,000 watts. I mean, it's not supposed to be continuously, but how many people do you know that's not on their cell phone anymore? And you got... You got 30 or 40 antennas on there putting out 50 watts and the dB gain of the height that they are, and they transmit in power. That power is going to the ground where you live, on the ground where you live, in your house. Let's Think about the, it, people. Let, it's let's go to, frying to the, you. To the sound aspect of it again, guys, would you allow a big speaker to be put on a pole above your house and be blasting at 50,000 decibels like an Alice Cooper concert? Would you? Because that's the loudness. Again, decibels. Let's go back to the radar. Radar is measured in decibels of Z. Okay, now that's technical again. Decibels, loudness, guys. Loudness. If you could hear it, it would be loud. It would be a loud rotating speaker 
coming from the next rat. You can't hear it. I'm sure there's some animals that can hear it. I'm sure of it. And they're probably all dead by now. Now, this is something else that happens. And this is kind of like the unsaid horror of us. I'm not talking about Big Brother. I'm talking about you and I, guys. The cell phone towers, the radio stations that we're listening to, every year there's something like 250 million birds that die because they either get caught in the magnetic fields of the towers, or like the magnetic transmissions. The reason those, those towers are so tall is not because of horizon communications. It's because they have to have certain transmitters so far away from people, the only way they can go is up. And so, for instance, when, when a, um, a poll worker goes to work on the cell phone tower, they have to power it down. They will not climb the tower with the transmissions going because you can get cooked. Yes, you can get cooked just like a microwave. You know how they discovered radar, right? There's this, it's somewhat of a wives' tale, but, um, you know, I'll just tell you the story. Supposedly, someone, the story says one way a guy had a chocolate bar, a scientist was walking by the radar, and he had a chocolate bar, a Hershey bar, wrapped in tinfoil in his front pocket, and it melted as he walked by. The other story is that someone placed their lunch out and that the lunch got cooked. And that's how they discovered that radio frequency could heat your food. And it was a radar transmitter. So back to radar. Radar can transmit heat. Now they'll say that's just localized and they say they call it non-ionizing radiation. Again, ionizing, technical term. Ions, we all understand little particles. Let's just call them little particles so everybody can understand what we're talking about here. There's Eight ionizing, minutes till break. huh? Eight minutes till break. Perfect. I can I can explain this in eight minutes time. Um, ionizing particles. I can explain it in one minute's time, guys. Don't worry. Um, ionizing particles. You could call them just little little pieces of dust, let's say, but they're microscopic and you can't see them, and they're made out of electricity and plasma and, and electrons. But you can imagine them like dust. Now they can produce these using radio frequency, literally, it's like putting a piece, if you ever put a piece of tin foil into a microwave, do not do this, but it will spark. The reason it's sparking is because the radio frequency, those vibrations that I was talking about earlier that you could see when you put your head to a vibrating pillow, um, those vibrations coming from that radio frequency literally strip off electrons. They found that this can be done in the atmosphere. So, Back to heart being closed. I got one we, thing I want to say. Everybody remembers the Batman and Catwoman, right? She put three aerosol cans in a microwave. She set it and walked away. What happened? It blew up. Go ahead, Dutch. I'm sorry. Oh, you're absolutely right. You put a contents under pressure in a microwave, and they expand because of the heating. Um, so nobody's surprised to hear that their microwave in their kitchen heats their food, but everybody's surprised to hear that their router that's a microwave or that their Bluetooth headset that's a microwave or that the radar down the road is going to heat something up. Now, the radar is 750,000 watts. Your kitchen microwave is 1,000 watts. So you can imagine 750 open microwaves on a tower with a directional dish rotating. And that's what the National Weather Service has around the country in these domes that you've seen around the country. Those are NEXRAD radar domes. They contain a large rotating dish that transmits this frequency out. The dome is to help filter and amplify or reduce outside interference with the signal. So that's why they've got the dome around it. But if you took the dome off, you would see a rotating dish that they can target upwards to a certain point, And that's called the tilt of the radar and the way that the signal comes out. They can target it now, and they can use dual polarity. And I would contend that when you watch the dual polarity switch and the harp ring occur, when you see the velocity switch on the actual, not relative mean velocity, guys, we're talking about actual wind speed measurements, that the wind speed changes. Now, that's huge. That's huge. I mean, it means what it means, guys is that HARP can go ahead and shut down. It doesn't matter because we've got usually two NEXRADs, if not more, per state. 
each one at 750,000 watts. Is it coincidental that at the height of the missile defense program, WSR-88, next rad, was rolled out across every city in strategic spots? Some don't make sense. They said they put them there for weather uh, strategic purposes. <laughs> Some of them are literally there to protect like the missiles out in the middle of Nebraska because they're overlapping. One overlaps the other. And I think we got four minutes till break, and we have two people online, Greg and Garrett, and we'll get to you guys. Somebody, after. somebody just asked about uh, harp. Can it drag space? To, uh, drag space junk using harp. Well, they don't generally use harp for that. They use the space fence. Which now there was a story that they closed that too, but in the same aspect, they were opening another one the same day. So. They didn't shut down one without having the other. They just didn't want you to know they had the other one. And we have articles on that, too, although you might have to look a little harder to find it. But, yes, there is information about that, too, and it is done with radio frequency to yeah, answer the a, question. A good question chat. about about space junk and whether or not it could be, well, like Drug a tractor, around, like a, moved, like a tra- some kind of tractor up, beam. up, tore up, whatever. They can, they've proved that they can generate 5,000-degree plasma in the atmosphere going up into space as far high as the magnetosphere, which pretty much is in space, so let's just say. So if they're able to do a 5,000-degree plasma bubble several kilometers wide and sustain it for over an hour, that was the 2013 experiment done by the U.S. Navy using HARP, that theoretically they could generate a 5,000-degree plasma bubble for an hour in space to burn up a space object or possibly redirect it out into space, possibly explode it. Now, there is the potential for tractor beams. Now, this goes into ra- what can radio frequency do. If you were able to somehow get an ant- let's say you have an incoming asteroid, if you were somehow able to get an antenna onto the surface of that asteroid and get it into the ground so it's nice and grounded, you could theoretically trans emit a signal to that base antenna if you have the appropriate receiving equipment on the uh, with the antenna that you could possibly generate some kind of tractor type device i mean this is this is stuff that we need to look into if if you were to listen to skeptics they would all say well i mean the skeptics said microwaving your food wasn't possible didn't they they said that wasn't going to work there was no way to it was discovered by accident right and that's how it goes with a lot of these things. You know, again, that goes back to the credentialed people versus non-credentials. I get dogged on. We got a minute or so before break. I get dogged. They say, hey, you have no credentials. You're not a licensed meteorologist. You're not a weatherman. Well, no. I mean, first of all, I never claimed to have any credentials. Never. Um, I am an average person who noticed something very strange occurring on radar, which we then tracked down the source and found out that it was having an effect, weather effect, Now, the biggest discoveries ever made are very seldomly made by professionals. They're too busy being professional and going with the flow. Since when is it it cool to be the man? I'll never be that. You know, if I were to seek out having credentials, they would have to be willing to accept me into school as I am. And that that wouldn't be, I don't think that would work unless we find a geophysics professor who's open-minded. Now, of course, all the stuff I'm talking about is already documented. But it's hidden. It's in the realm of conspiracy still. Why? Because people don't want to believe the facts. You know, they want to believe that the Stone Age stuff. Why? I don't know. U.S. military has already done these experiments. It's just a matter of reason why people wanted to believe that the Earth was flat. Yeah. Yeah. I hear music. All right, guys. We'll get back after the break. Um, Greg and Garrett, you guys are on the line. We'll get to you right after. Welcome back. Freedom Frequency 1871. Time is now 9.05 p.m. Eastern Time, May 16th, 2014. In the last hour, we've been talking about the headlines, a little bit of earthquake and a lot of harp and frequency, trying to break it down to you guys how it works. And so you can get, get your head around the new systems that are coming into play. And before break, 
We were just talking about, you know, all these different systems that are currently at play. Some of them are our fault. I mean, my fault too, guys. I've got a wireless router downstairs. I'm on a Wi-Fi right now. I'm using a smartphone. I don't use the uh, Bluetooth headset. I use a wired headset or speakerphone. I very rarely put it up to my head because I worked at the cell phone company. Two people came down with brain cancer at the place that I worked at of 100 people behind their ears. Behind, you know, in the lower left-hand or right-hand side of their uh, lower lobe, okay? So it's obvious that what caused that. Now, I just put a link in here to our producer and to Tat. It's for the live weather feeds page. And we got something going on down in Texas right now on radar. And this fits perfectly into what I want to get into right before we take our callers. I wanted to briefly touch on abuse and why we're willing to put up, why people are willing to put up with abuse in general. I mean, we're going to, let me give you an example. Why does somebody put up, you know, you hear about a a battered person, okay? Why does somebody put up with being beat? Why do we as a society put up with the police beating us? Why do we put up with weather modification if we've got such a problem with it? Well, let me give you a good example, guys. This past, on the 15th, yesterday, there was a weather modification conference open to the public in Durango, Colorado. On May 10th, I put out several blurbs asking someone out of the millions of people that live in the region to go to Durango, Colorado to this weather modification conference. And no one went. They They had professionals speaking on why they're spraying out in Colorado. Now, you're not going to believe this. Out in Colorado, they are spraying on the off the western slope to increase snowfall pack enhancement for the ski resorts. They're spraying silver iodide, which is killing the forests. Silver iodide, they try to blame it on the beetles out there. It's not the beetles. It's the spray. And they're doing it for, and that's my contention, of course, that's my opinion. Someone has to do the scientific studies to prove that it's not the beetles that are doing this. And that the, the overall death of the conifer forest out there is due to excessive weather modification for profit only. Uh, let me give you another example. 2012, 2013, going into 2014, Idaho, up in Idaho, uh, Idaho Power partnered up with National Weather Service and NOAA and Weather Modification Incorporated, a company that specializes in spraying. One of many, another one called Desert Research Institute out in California that just made record snowfall happen up in Tahoe during the drought. But up in Idaho, they spray to increase the snowfall on BLM land, Bureau of Land Management land. Why? So that when it runs off, it goes into the rivers and Idaho power can harness that power and through the hydroelectric dams uh, provide power that they sell back to the people. And they pay something like... um, a couple million dollars, and they get a huge return in the power they sell back, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to power their dam, and they'd have to let the water out, guys, and it would have to go downstream like it normally would, and you'd be able to enjoy a river like it normally should be. So they have to pay to do that. They're doing it everywhere, Colorado, Texas, North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas. Remember the drought last year? Everybody, all the withered corn and and corn prices went up. They were doing weather mitigation then. They were spraying to make the storms stop. Their excuse was they wanted to mitigate hail damage. So they did hail mitigation, which is documented in the American Society of Civil Engineers Hail Mitigation book, which is available on YouTube. Or you could go on Google and look it up. But you can somebody's actually put it through a reader where you can go have the whole lesson read to you about how to suppress hail using particulate matter. Again, spray. Now, last week, NASA confirmed in a conference of the possibility of hiring an airline company to fly around 24-7 with doped fuel using jet fuel exhaust, chemtrails, okay? You know, passenger liner flies over, leaves a big old cloud across the sky, okay? Using jet fuel to perform weather modification. And the idea is to spread a lot of cloud out to uh, reduce sun 
solar radiation management, sun coming through the clouds, spread a lot of cloud out that reflects it back up into uh, space, and it makes it cooler down below. It's like a volcanic winter, okay? And this is all them talking. So the people who are in denial and say, oh, there's no such thing as weather modification, or you don't have credentials to talk about this. Uh, well, where, where do you get your credentials on weather modification? Okay, I mean, it's from reading. It's from reading the American Society of Civil Engineers books. It's from reading the, the patents. It's from paying attention to the experiments being done and documenting them. That's, that's how you learn these things. I'm sure there's some weather modification school you could go to. There's probably some program maybe at, let's say, Stanford. Oh, wait, I can't use Stanford because of uh, the Philippines national director of their NOAA said that I, when I used the word Stanford that I was dropping their name. Meanwhile, I'm giving examples from Stanford of how high frequency can convert to low frequency, how a, a hurricane can come out of nowhere, and I can't use the name Stanford because it's name dropping. Well, I don't think so. It's, it, this is what we run into time and time again, which is the denial. Why do people put up with this abuse? Why do people, why do people feel so dependent on something? It's like a drug. Okay, that's another great example. Drugs. Okay, people that are on drugs, it's like this zombie mentality that everybody's living under trying to explain on weather modification. It's like trying to get a drug user to stop using drugs. They deny it. They deny <laughs> they deny it. You have to convince them first that they're on the drug. Then you have to fight the, the power that be uh, that, that put it there to in the first place. It's dependency. It's dependency on being a zombie. It's easier to embrace that drug than it is to confront reality. And in this case, with our society, the drug is, um, well, I'd say the drug is the suburban dream. You know, when you ask anybody, why don't you take action? Why don't you go down and say something? Or why don't you go up and throw something at those people going in to pump the weather? You know, throw a tomato at them. Well, I don't want to go to jail. I got to go to work. I got to pay for my house. Right? I mean, that's, everybody wants to maintain their drug of choice. Some pe for some people, their drug of choice is being a suburban shithead. Another person's drug of choice is um, being an erotic cleaner. Okay. TV, Another per radio. Hmm? TV is a drug. Yeah. Listening to radio, listening to music, it's a drug. Mm -hmm. It's to stimulate you in a way that takes your mind off of what's really happening around you. Yeah. Off the painful Keeping nature. you from talking to your friends, talking to people, occupying you in a way that you can be isolated from the truth. Then mm -hmm. same would apply to with um, technology with computers even and Facebook. People sitting online playing Farmville all day, disconnecting from human contact. Yeah. Oh, yes, exactly. Being distracted on why they're there to begin with because they lost their job. <laughs> right. And welcome to the broadcast, by the way, Chrissy. Thank you. I'm sorry. Hi. <laughs> hey, no, no, you're cool. I'm, I'm glad you jumped in because this is something you, you brought up a good point. Video games. Video games connect through to the same dopamine sections of your brain that a drug does. You ever meet somebody who plays too much World of Warcraft? There's a South Park episode on it that's hilarious. They get all <laughs> fat. They get pimples. Or they, you know, and this is for real. And if you ever meet somebody who does too much drugs... They get crazy. They get that, that same mentality, okay? They let their bodies go. They look like shit. They act like an asshole, and they're only concerned about the game. And, you know, for some people, the game is drugs. Some people, the game is the game. Some people, the game is too much, um, you know, you ever meet somebody who's a real asshole after, when they don't have their coffee? Yes. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'm a, uh, let me speak from personal experience. Okay. I was gonna say that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 Yeah. I don't have my coffee. I'm gonna be pissed off. And it, so we have, we all have our escape mechanism. But if you if you hit escape too many times, right, your system crashes. Right? I mean, come on. So why do we put up with it? Out of convenience, man. That's why. That's the only reason. It's to satisfy our own self desires. To, to not rock the boat and to maintain what we've got even though it's so horrible. Because confronting something, look, man, look, we all know it. If, you're, if, you're, if you ever stood in a river or a stream that's running really fast and try to walk against it, all that water splashes up. Yeah, you, get, you can lose your footing and fall down. 
going against the flow and, and going against something you know to be wrong or a dependency that you have, or in this case, weather modification or whatever, going against it, look, man, you're going to have a, a group of people that are sitting there, oh, no, there's nothing wrong, pretending there's no problem. That's, that's how we got into this problem in our country is pretending there's not a problem. Same thing happens in your personal life. You pretend there's not a problem, next thing you know, shit hits the fan. Something really bad happens. Everybody sits around and says, well, we'll vote in a new president next time or we'll vote in somebody new next time. But they don't ever take the step for themselves to make that change. They just worried about what other people's going to do and listen to other people's opinion instead of having their own opinion. They're followers. They're not leaders. No one is supposed to follow anybody. You're supposed to lead yourself. Don't follow no one. Lead. Mm -hmm. If you see something wrong, fix it yourself. Get others to help you. Not to follow you, but to help you. That's how you become great people and great leaders. Be a leader. Don't be a follower. And don't be a coward. That was awesome. Yeah. yeah. Then there's there's the opposite. There's people that go to the extreme, though. Yes, that's the ones that are trying to steal from you. Mm-hmm. That's why you have to be a leader and understand what they're trying to do to you. Right. You, you got to always remember that, you know, look, we, we're all fought, trying to, we all have a sense of what's right and wrong unless you're crazy, okay? And it's proved that people with, uh, you know, mental disorders and stuff um, don't have the appropriate sense of right and wrong. Most other people, like let's say 90% of the population, is relatively well-grounded and can understand the difference between harming someone and not um, and that's why most of us become outraged, let's say, with weather modification. I keep going back to weather mod because that's a perfect example of the oppression that we all endure in our personal lives. This is something that's done to us, that flies over us, that dusts upon us, and that we're left to deal with. The question is, is are you going to stand up and say, enough's enough? Are you going to let that shithead keep flying over you and dusting on you? Or are you going to finally stand up and say, no more dusting on me, you piece of shit? And that's what's happening, okay? We are at a point now where they're, they're coming out. Their hand has been forced to come out on weather modification, harp, chemtrails, cloud seeding. They're having open weather modification conferences now where, again, no one went from the community. Do I have to get in my car in St. Louis, Missouri and drive to Durango, Colorado? There are other people out there. The problem is, is getting people to rock the boat and be willing to make a stink over something that's clearly wrong. Look, man, if you've got a drug user in your life, let's go back to the drug aspect again. This is something that touches on my family personally, so I can use this example. If you've got a drug user in your family and you want to try and correct that situation, there's no easy way around it. You've got to blatantly come out and confront them. With the government, if you've got, or an alcoholic, this is another example. Everybody has to deal with some kind of alcoholic in their family. Confronting an alco- alcoholic is the hardest thing to do because most people live in, a, in denial. And they come up with every excuse in the book of why the person's not an alcoholic or why they need to, you know, it's not a problem or whatever. But we all know it's a problem. And sometimes that alcoholic causes someone else problems. Yeah, get drunk and then go drive and then they cause a problem for someone else, you know? It's like nobody has a problem with the alcoholic who sits at home alone. It's when they beat other people, you know, or, or whatever. I mean, that's when the people have the problem with the drunk. So, you know, again, this is a, a case of settling for something And we are settling, guys. We are. The community is. We have a chance to take action. Look, I'm not the biggest Alex Jones fan. He's carried my story from time to time, and I appreciate that. Um, And it's not that I have anything against Alex Jones. It's just, you know, listening to talk radio and loud guys and stuff. I'm just not my thing, man. So, but Alex Jones 
put out a profound broadcast yesterday, which was touching on his reporters being arrested. And he sat there on air and talked to a lieutenant at the base. And Alex Jones, God bless his heart this time, he actually sat there and kept it cool while he was talking and laid out fact after fact after fact after fact about the military industrial complex, new world order takeover, which we all know, again, is something we're settling for. And we're all just letting happen because we don't want to rock the boat. Here's Alex Jones saying it verbatim to the guy at the base who's holding his two reporters there because they dared to come to the military base to ask questions about U.S. interrogation centers where they have a Baptist church, mock-up Baptist church. The whole thing is to fight Tea Party people, right? Because we need to fight Americans who are, uh, you know, gun-holding Americans who are fed up with federal government being complete assholes. And that's the problem is, you know, you listen to the commercials in between our breaks. They're great, man. I had nothing to do with making them, but they're great. I mean, we're dealing with a bunch of assholes. And so they treat us like assholes would. And again, this is like just like in personal life. How long are you going to let an asshole treat you like an asshole before you – look, if you don't address a situation with an asshole, it eventually turns into a fight. And we don't want that in our country. Tat and I specifically do not want a violent revolution in this country. It will never solve anything. The armaments of the New World Order far surpass anything you could ever possibly imagine, guys. And if you try to fight against that, they're going to roll all that shit out. So the only way to fight them is for us to stay home for mm-hmm. one day and show them if we did that for a week, it would bankrupt them mm-hmm. completely, 100 percent. If everybody was to stay home and not go to work just one day, they would have to start listening because if we started doing it once a week, oh, my God. If we started doing it twice a week, how long do you think it would take them to start backing off? Well, I, you know, Tat, and I think that's a great idea. And I think it should be timed with a 50-state push all at once to collect the appropriate signatures in each of all 50 states to get a state ballot initiative, kind of like what they've done with marijuana legalization where you get the appropriate signatures, it gets put on the ballot and worded as such that corporate government to make money off the citizens should no longer be allowed on a state level. And if you were able to get enough states to pass this, it could then be pushed to a constitutional amendment to the Constitution that outlaws corporate government and replaces the government with nonprofit government. So everybody still keeps their jobs. All the government workers still get to go to work on Monday. But guess what? Come Friday, they have to have a fundraiser to raise payment for all that work that was just done. Just like me online. If I want to raise money, I've got to put up a fundraiser. AdSense pays $1 to $5 a day. Okay? I mean, come on. Nobody can live on $1 to $5 a day on ads. So I have to put up a fundraiser to raise the appropriate money to even do anything that I want to do. All right? So the government, imagine if the government had to raise money to pay the cops. Well, guess what? All of a sudden, the cops are nice as pie unless there's a real crime kicking because they know at the end of the week, no one's going to give to that fundraiser and they're not going to get a paycheck. And guess what? They might not show up to their job the next Monday. But that's okay because we'd all be willing to contribute to some other group then to come in and do police work, right? Because we value as citizens, I value police there in case something goes down or Kind of huge crime. Well, we don't committed. have nothing in this country anymore except for police and bankers and financial organizations where people sit behind desks. We don't build nothing in this country anymore, people. We don't build TVs. We don't build cars. We don't build hardly anything in this country. Even I think we've got one steel factory left in this country. <clears throat> Just one. Before long, you ain't going to have no place to work because if you don't have industry, you don't have banks and you don't have anything else. All you have is slavery. Well, I've got an idea, Tat. Do you want to hear it? Listen. Well, the U.S., for all, everybody that's listening right now, I mean, how many people are in here? 50? I don't even know how many people are in here. 50 or 100 people. Okay. Um, 
if we could somehow manage to convince our fellow citizens that the wave of the future is now and that the United States, being who we are and what we've done in the past, could theoretically seize upon certain discoveries that have been made lately, some having to do with radio frequency, some having to do with uh, computing. I, for instance, I've got a series of inventions that I'd be willing to give out free to the world that could solve a lot of problems. And we could make these devices. We could turn the United States into some place that's admirable again, that builds new next generation technologies. But what that requires, guys, is a convincing of all the naysayers and skeptics that this technology exists. And I'm talking about wireless power transfer, which is now documented. Imagine the potential for wireless power transfer. If we're already all using 2.45 gigahertz routers in your house, why not make a light bulb that runs on it? Why not make a light bulb that converts the 2.45 gigahertz signal from your router through a gallium arsenide diode, just like NASA says in their experiment? It's an amplifier. And out the other end comes DC current. Now, we'd have to get the schematic from the 1975 experiment, which is public, and build that into a light bulb. All of a sudden, everything that you've got in your house now is powered by your router. And it's sucking up a lot of that frequency, so it's not going into you. Okay? These are potential uses. A car that could be running on cell phone power. So, in other words, 2.45 gigahertz coming from the cell phone tower could be easily converted in your car to power your car forever. Why not make a car that runs that way? Why not make an aircraft that's powered that way? You know, I've got another one. Here's another invention. I never, you know, we're getting on inventions. This, I love talking about this stuff. I'm sorry, guys. We'll get to the callers after this next break, I promise. But here, here's another one. I have a reinvented jet engine that will work at higher altitudes, produces, uses no fuel, completely electric, and it'll work. It just needs to be built. I've already tried contacting Boeing, Lockheed, tried to send a message to Richard Branson. He's inaccessible on his party island with the naked chicks on his back while he's windsurfing out in the ocean. So, you know, there's a chance to turn the country around, but nobody will. Nobody gives a flying fuck. Why? Because they're too busy with their cordless and their wireless connections and all the stuff that's killing them, and they don't even know it. Exactly. And enough people don't hear. Or What's listen. That, Chrissy? Sorry, Chrissy. It's okay. I, I think I'm lagging a little bit. I'm hearing uh, myself talk. We're in the zombie apocalypse. That's why. It's a paradigm shift. 2012. I don't know what it is, but it's it's more like poop a shit, poopoo shit, poo poo shift to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that pole shifted right somewhere up the rear, man. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what, guys. You know, talking about all this stuff. It leads all the way. We got like less than a minute to break and we'll get to all the callers. I promise. But talking about this stuff leads me one place. You need to question authority. You need to question the status quo. You need to go against the stream. Stand up for what's right. Do the painful truth or thing. Confront the evil. Because if you don't, man, that's going to creep up and it's going to bite you in the ass. We'll get back after the break. Oh, I love it. Hey, guys. Nuts here. Tattooed here. It's 9.35 a.m. And uh, we have 30 more minutes to go, and we're going to have to get into these callers. I think Garrett hung up. Garrett, if you're listening, um, I have just reshared the Dutch Sense chat group. If you're listening, guys, one of my viewers, our viewers, Garrett, a uh, person who's deeply concerned about the way things are going in our country, a, a younger person in his teens, set up a chat group for us to use. And I'm sharing that link. It's on my Dutch Sense main page, and it's Chat Tango. So you can use your current Chat Tango account. You can discuss with other people, share links, share videos, just talk amongst yourselves, and talk away. Um, so that's definitely available. I want to thank Garrett for that. Um, you know, tonight's broadcast, guys, I, you know, I hate to get so serious on all this, but, you know, it's, it's what we're willing to put up with. 
that's the only reason we've got what we've got. My parents' generation didn't know, I don't think. You know, I think a lot of our parents just didn't know, man. The, the information wasn't there. There was no internet. There was no way to get the info. They didn't and have that, the technology that we have today. Right. It's up to us, our generation. Yeah. Falls on us, guys. It figures, you know, it'd fall on anywhere from between the, you know, the 60s hippie generation to Gen X, pretty much, um, for it to fall on our, our shoulders. Who better to deal with it, quite frankly? I mean, a bunch of video gamers and old partiers? I mean, come on. <laughs> this is great. I mean, it's like, it's like a match made in heaven. We've got a bunch of New World Order straight-laced squares versus a bunch of people who've had it. And, you know, and the squares are in denial about the technology, by the way, most of them. So, you know, it's going to fall on to the researchers and the people out there to make the difference. And, you know, I've invented a microwave gun. <laughs> it'll work. I promise it'll work. Ten microwaves, a direct TV satellite dish, and stand back, baby, because uh, you're going to fry something. And uh, at least take out the electronic components. You know, watch out black helicopters, right? I just gave out an invention. Uh, let's get to the callers. Who's first? Greg? Yeah, yeah Greg. Greg, what's up, brother? Hey, man, what's going on? Dude, good to hear your voice, man. I missed you this past week. What's going on? How you been? Oh, man, I've been awake for so long, I don't even know what day it is. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome Actually, to the world. <laughs> oh, man, I only got like three hours of sleep, so I'm kind of tired. Anyway. Hey, you told me you were going to go take a nap with me. Yeah, well, I didn't do it. <laughs> oh, you passed up a nap? Oh, with Chrissy? Oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> Greg, yeah, oh, brother, how you doing, man? Is how's hey. California, man? Everything? I mean, last I, I talked to you, I, I don't know. I'm a, I'm just watching. I kind of on the bottom of my Skype screen here. I'm watching Fukushima shaking right now because they had an earthquake in Kamchatka, four point three, just right on the southern tip. It was about eh, two and a half hours ago or something like that. So Fukushima's starting to really move around like Miley Cyrus, so. You know Whatever. what, though? I was looking at the Fukushima cam the one day. I think Dutch put it on his Facebook um, that it would make a, a, a good uh, low-rate, low-budget um, horror movie because a spider was walking on the lens. You could see the spider. Oh, yeah, I saw that. that so I was spider. wondering, how bad is the radiation if, if insects live there? I mean, I don't know. Are oh, they it's so, adaptable, yeah, the radiation? Really it, it, it's I can't even remember that. I think it was like something like four four billion back rolls or something. You know, yes. it's, it's, just, it, it's so bad. It, it, it's ridiculous. In fact, I think the workers, even in full uh, NBC suits, they can't uh, be out for more than like twenty minutes, or it becomes a lethal dosage. <laughs> so they if they have to go out and fix something. They got to move really quick. And do but it, insects you know, almost can live like in you it? have to have a lineup of guys, you know, okay, he's done. Next. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. In, Turn insects, that ball, you know? insects can live in it. Um, you know, um, a good example is Chernobyl. Um, they've got the woods around Chernobyl, which immediately reclaimed as soon as the uh, accident happened and the people left. Um, a lot of the plant life and bug life still survives. Um it gets it, it's uh, this goes back to like Godzilla. <laughs> yeah, say a lot it, but... of it's mutated. They've got a lot of mutations all around the plant. You know, well, it, that, it's that terrible. spider did have sixteen I mean, insects. Everything it, it's they just all have really strange generate. You know, next generation insects with all kinds of mutations. I mean, look at the seacoast of California and Washington, Oregon. I mean, the starfish are dying. You got uh, you got your walruses and your seals with sores all over them, missing fear, missing fur, and oh God, I don't know. I, I've seen some salmon that were caught that were yellow inside with a whole bunch of black spots all over the the tissue. It, it, it's just it, terrible. I mean, <laughs> bad. Dolphins are sick. You know, whales are beaching themselves. It's um, incredible. It's terrible. You want me to run down Fukushima for you? or? Yeah, let's have it, man. Hear it. Okay, well, like uh, design errors. Uh, one thing they really screwed up on was to lower. Uh, they dropped 100 feet down to about the sea level, you know, like about 30 feet above the sea level. 
So they should not have excavated. They should have left the plant way up high. They made an error on not using submersible pumps, which is what really caused the whole failure. Oh, besides the, uh, you know, the earthquake that hit. It uh, was the M9 on 11-11, uh, at uh, 3-11-11. Yeah. Right? Okay, it knocked down the power tower so they, uh, and the power line so they couldn't get outside power, you know, to keep the pumps going. But the pumps were flooded. And since they weren't submersible pumps, it destroyed the pumps. The diesel generators could have worked anyway with the tsunami hitting. They would have worked even in water. I mean, they were flooded. So anyway, they dropped the plant down, you know, and, and set it down 100 feet below where it should have been. And uh, as the tsunami came in, it killed the pumps flooded the uh, generator rooms. They couldn't get outside power to keep the, you know, water going in, cooling pools. So uh, then you got these reactions going on, you know, because they don't have enough coolant. So, so the fuel rods begin to melt, and then it blows up number one, blows up number two, and really calls a, a detonation con deconflagration. On number three, just blew that sucker, what, about three, about 3,000 feet mushroom cloud in the air? You've seen that picture, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it threw a bunch of rods. I think it threw out about 640 rod assemblies out of the reactor in number three. Blew them almost two kilometers, two kilometers away. So that's about 1.2 miles. And so they got these guys, Just they just buried them. You know, they just put dirt over the top of them for the time being. I mean, it, it, it's disgusting. So anyway, a lot of these rods go out into the water, right? So it's polluting the ocean. They're losing about 300 to 600 metric tons of radioactive water a day. Uh, one other error they made is they built the plant on an ancient riverbed. Oops. And so they get water runoff underground that's going down underneath the aquifer several hundred feet below the plant. So you got these three reactor cores that have melted all the way into the reactor cores. I mean, all the way into the aquifers. And so they're just continually melting. They've drilled a whole bunch of holes in the ground to suck the water out. They're filling these giant tanks up that are leaking, I might add. <laughs> and so, so you've got all these tanks full of radioactive water. They've got a filtration plant, but sometimes it doesn't work all the time. So, so it just, I don't know, man. It just keeps pumping uh, radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean. It just really makes me mad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beyond mad. You know, guys, huh? we, after Fukushima happened, yeah. um, got the Geiger counters, and in June of 2011, drove across the country from right. North Carolina. Remember that? North I think I watched you. The whole, yeah, yeah, I watched it. Yeah. yeah, and that was several months after. Now, that was in March when, when all that blew. And in June, I went across the country taking measurements, and the highest measurements came in Wyoming, Montana, and Colorado at nighttime, no less. So it's not like it was solar or anything like that. Um, right. The higher the elevation, the higher the reading, obviously, obviously. And it was not solar because, again, we were doing them at night. And it wasn't cosmic ray either, no incoming. We had access to the feeds, no incoming uh, cosmic ray blasts, let's say. And what that proved to me was that at a higher elevation, there was a greater concentration of radio active particulate matter, and that has since been proved in the snow measurements that happened over the last two years. Each time right. it snowed here in St. Louis, I'm out there with the Geiger counters taking measurements in the same spot so we can you know, have something to track from, and there it is. In the snow, okay, on a regular day, 30 to 40 counts per minute, and on a snow event, like out in the snow, as the snow is falling, anywhere between 70, 60 to 80 counts per minute. Now, that's below alert level, but you got to figure that's over the entire 
possibly the entire Earth. If you were to go in a snowstorm on the East Coast and take a measurement, if you were to go in a snowstorm in the Southwest and take a measurement, and go in a snowstorm in Europe and take a measurement, then you'd start to get a better idea of how it's dispersing around the planet. But that's mm-hmm. proved. I mean, there it is. It's in the precipitation. It, it's all over the United States. We're, we're mm-hmm. just bathed in it. We're just the whole North American continent is just jack. You know, I mean, it, it's bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I ain't, yeah. I ain't trying some... to be rude or nothing, Dutch, but we got several more callers. Oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. We start talking. Fukushima is something that really concerns Greg, obviously, and me too. Uh, enough that I, you know, traveled across the country to go find out what's going on, and I'm probably going to try and do that again this year at some time, maybe in June of, we're only a month away, um, yeah. you know, try to get those measurements Temple again at the same time. I think they spent about a week and a half or something out, out in California, mm-hmm. um, Jakarta Jackson and his crew, mm-hmm. and, and they went and measured it. Hey, there was this... There was this one guy that was catching some fish on the on a pier in San Diego. That was their last stop, and uh, he caught a fish. So Jakari was over and throws his uh, to Serco, I think they call it Tur- Tur- Tesserco. You know that that particular one. It's a sixteen hundred and sixty dollar radiation. Yes, yeah, he t- yeah with the wand. Yeah, he took the wand and put it over it. Yeah, and he put it on the fish, and it had sixty counts per minute. Oh, yeah, it sh- the fish shouldn't have 60 counts per minute, guys. We're talking a, a normal background in the it's water 30. should be much lower. Yeah, 20. it should be around 30, they said. So it was twice yeah. It was twice normal background radiation. Mm-hmm. And that'll keep, yeah. keep happening for the next 30 years every it's year. Longer than that, it's going to be about 26,000 years, actually. That's just Well, yeah, happen. yeah. I mean, it, depending on what, what elements. County. But this the, yeah. the cesium is that, you know, the one that everybody's talking about. Um, 30, we're looking at 30, 30 years, 134, it's like 30 days. Yeah. For, yeah. That's half-life. That's half-life. Right. It becomes half as strong. It's still radioactive. It's just yeah. less less of a uh, less of a radioactive signature. It's still harmful, guys. There is no safe amount yeah. of radiation. That's why no, this is such a big deal. It's a, it's a linear function. And uh, long, it says, as long as Fukushima is still gone, we're in trouble because it, it's just going to keep throwing the stuff out for us, you know, because it goes into the jet stream and trade winds. And, and you know, we're kind of like dead meat. <laughs> Basically, we're walking dead men. Well, so, radi- radiation mm-hmm. itself coming from like plutonium or uranium is ionizing radiation versus right. what we were talking about with the cell phones and the cell towers, non-ionizing radiation. Um, John Hutchinson. Of all people, guys, and I'm going to, Greg, we're going to have to get off the phone after this, so I'll have to take the next caller, but just hear me out on this, Greg. You're going to love this. John okay. Hutchinson did an experiment in 2012 where a laboratory sent him a test uh, sample of uranotite, which is a type of uranium, a natural re- uranium. John right. Hutchinson, using a scalar process crossing two electromagnetic beams, for 30 days bombarded the piece of uranotite with electromagnetic frequency of some kind. He did not, I do not know what he used, okay? Yeah. The sample was set back to the laboratory. The laboratory documented this same sample. And parts of the uranium transmuted, literally, into elements like copper and gold. Like we're talking at neutron exchange. Some weird stuff happened. And right. the, the uh, radioactive signature on the sample that was sent to him was something like 40,000 CPM, right? So real heavy, like, okay, it was real high. I mean, I might be exaggerating on that. Uh, This is two years ago that I read this whole paper. There's a paper on it, peer-reviewed with science, and he halved it in 30 days by pulsing it with electromagnetic frequency. It changed the substance of the uranotite into little flecks of gold, copper inside of the rock. He sent the rock back. They said, this is the same piece, but wow, it's cut in half. And the parts of it have changed. Now, we're, none of us are shocked when we put a piece of aluminum foil in the microwave and it sparks and it withers after time. It looks like it gets burnt and it changes shape. It gets wavy. It, it looks different. It might even turn into ash or powder if you bombard it long enough. Okay, nobody's surprised when that happens. I propose that possibly one of the uses for high frequency could be you know, you wonder why did the Russians put that giant antenna apparatus right next to Chernobyl, the woodpecker? It's to strip. Oh my God, I didn't know yeah. the woodpecker was so close to it. 
Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's directed right on it. And oh. they, see, this, this, you may not know this. That Okay, I'm just going to keep talking, guys, because this is very important. A lot of people don't know this. Right after um, Japan had their earthquake, a physicist, a nuclear scientist, came forth. He's from Finland. He doesn't speak a lick of English. He only speaks Finnish. And uh, his name is Arto Lori. And he put out a video where he explains how Fukushima, how the earthquake happened. And what happened before the earthquake in March of 2011, there was another nuclear leak that very few people know about in another part of Japan that released a large radioactive cloud of some kind. And Arto Lori said in 2011, took a few days or whatever, a week after the earthquake, this occurred. Or before the earthquake, I'm sorry. And they used Japan's version of HARP, which was the MU, the MU, to strip electrons from the radioactive cloud and take the electrons to ground. And it transmutes the dust that's in the air into something else. The John Hutchinson effect that I'm just telling you about now. Okay, and now here's the crazy part. The U.S. has a group of scientists called the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. And it's their contention that a large amount of methane is set to release from the North Pole. And it's their idea to use a facility like HARP or ISCAT in Europe, which is the European version of HARP, to pulse the methane and change it into diamond dust using frequency. Now, this is their whole thing. I mean, these are scientists talking about using frequency to transmute methane into diamond dust. John Hutchinson done the experiment to transmute uranotite into a non-radioactive, less radioactive substance, which means that Arto Lori is most likely correct and that the Japan earthquake was an electron precipitation done via the Japanese themselves to protect their country from a previous radiological release. And that was all his contention. So I just thought you guys might want to know that. that hey, there is hey, before pure... you cut me off, I, and I want to let the other callers get in, not, on, not enough time. God, I wish you had a three-hour show. Because <laughs> I really could have run this down a little bit better. Uh, folks, go to TEPCO Live, just T-E-P-C-O, Live Camera or just cam and uh if you want to see fukushima shaking like hell right now uh, the other thing is um cesium goes to muscle and tissues all over your body so heart attacks are going to go up okay it doesn't matter if it's cesium 134 137 radioactive uh, iodine 131 132 134 goes into your thyroid gland Displaces normal iodine, so you can get thyroid tumors. And uh, strontium-90 in the air coming down goes into your bones, so you can get osteogenic sarcomas. That's all I want to say, and I'm going to get off. Thanks. And uh, can Ryan, can you just leave me on live and, and instead of cutting me off, and I'll just shut up. Right on, guys. Yeah, th I mean, again, this is like some serious information on Fukushima that really we need to spend a whole show going over. I know everybody's talked Fukushima for the last two to three years, but this is the time where over the next several years where we're going to start to see that accumulation build up. Now we got, what, five minutes left? Let's go to the next caller. Um, we can take one more caller here before the show is out. Hello? 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 Hello. Hi, who, who am I speaking to? This is Gretchen. Oh, hey, thanks for calling back. You know what? Before I get to my topic, I like what Greg said, and I believe that someone ought to be immediately starting to test the lower life forms like the frogs and the, the small uh, single cells, smaller celled animals to see what they're absorbing and, and what the mutations will be. But I was calling about your comment about why people lay there in the weeds and don't do anything and they want well-meaning people can't take the chance. Here's why. I just got online while I was uh, listening. There are $200 billion worth of bailouts that the government gave to all the corporations and the banks, mostly banks, in 08. And um, a lot of that has never been paid back. And people... 
companies invest their their investors they invest the money in the stock market and you will never be able to change it we live in a capitalist society but people like you you younger people are going to have to just stay hang in there Chrissy Mike Pat, anybody, and and just keep chipping away at it because that's what it's going to take. And, by the way, Brazil has a big protest going on because the World Cup, $24 billion spent building a soccer stadium, and people in Brazil are poverty-stricken, and they are protesting and burning rubber tires in the streets. Wow. So the whole world is is coming to realize that there's inequities and, and everyone has to stick together. Yeah, so those I agree. Are my thoughts. Hey, you're okay, absolutely you guys, right. Uh, have it. Make make your little discussion. I'll get off the line that so you can make a few comments about what I said. Thank well, you for raising that that okay. point. You know, guys, down in Brazil, it's a socialist country where they put in a lot personally, and they expect a lot back. And usually, their government gives it to them. So, and when they don't, it's shit hit the fan time, man. You're talking. You don't want to piss off the people. Go, go talk to the people in France. They acquiesce to the people. You know, France, our allies, supposedly, really, they hate us. Have you ever been there? Oh, my God. I hate Americans. I don't blame them, man. Look what we are. Look what we've become. <laughs> Sometimes I hate Americans. You're right. <laughs> yeah. I'm afraid of Americans like David Bowie. You know, I, you know for real, guys. We've we got one minute left. I'd like to give Tat the opportunity to take us out. And just, you know, again, drive home the point on 1871. So, guys, you know, listen to what Tat has to say here. Which is apparently nothing. I know, I even muted. I'm like, I'm going to cough or something. I'm muted. I'm muted. I'm muted. <laughs> I started to talking and didn't even say. realize I was muted. <laughs> but anyway, folks, we got one thing that can help us and help our country. That's to bring back our original Constitution. That's the only thing that's going to help us. And the only way f- that I see, unless someone can come up with a better idea without using guns and bloodshed and getting out in the streets to scream you want freedom is to stay home and us work up something to stay at home to make that happen so we can be free if we have to keep doing it over and over and over again until we break their their backs with this money that they're using against us much love to y'all y'all have a great night And from my cold, dead hands, abolish the Act 1871 if you love your freedom. Damn right. Thanks for listening to FPRN. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook and Twitter. If you'd like to start your own show with FPRN, advertise with us or donate to the network or to your favorite shows, check out our website at www.fprnradio.com.